Thank you. So, good morning, everybody. Um, I usually start talks in Ghana by settling a problem uh, about something, but I'm not going to talk about this because Shakir is here. He has heard me talk about this many times. Um, I'll just say one sentence. Jollof rice is not from Ghana. <laughs> and, and that's it. Okay, that settles the debate. Let's move to something more serious. Uh, so, I want to, to speak today about what we call AI, machine learning mostly, and uh, where we are now and what we can do with it. And what are the exciting challenges that we see ahead, and especially here in, in Africa? So I now work for Google, and uh, Google is a, um, whoops, it's a distributed research organization that Google AI specifically, that has labs in different parts of the world, in North America, in Europe, in the Middle East in Asia, and now in Africa. So last year, so last year we announced the Google AI Center here in Accra as um, a new lab in this distributed research organization, whose mission is to do research and advance the, the art uh, of machine learning and AI the same way it is done in other research institutions across the world, but hopefully with a new perspective, bring a fresh perspective to all this research and apply the results to problems, challenges that are of particular interest in this region. So since we announced it, whoops. So I was talking about the mission we have at Google AI and more specifically at, at the Google AI here in Accra, which is to advance the art, to work on um, cutting edge research, but also to apply the results of this research to challenges that are of interest in this region in particular. So since we announced it um, eight to 10 months ago, we've been busy building the team and uh, you know setting up projects, et cetera, and today, I'm very excited to, oops, ah. okay, so I'm very excited today to be, to work with all these, all these people um, coming from all over the world, some local, like York, who was born here, and uh, to work on all of these challenges together. So we are open for business, we're just here in um, Roman Ridge in, We'll be extremely happy to discuss science and um, interesting applications with uh, uh, potential collaborators in various institutions in, in Accra, in Ghana, and, and across Africa. So we do research, and um, in the way it works in general across all the Google Labs is we have fundamental research teams that work on you know, classical machine learning problems, et cetera, but we also have teams building infrastructure like TensorFlow that people are using, um, that are very popular, used beyond even industry, but in, in academic labs and, and, and other places. We also have teams that who work, which work on, um, on more applied projects and products and, um, and research in other emerging emerging fields like healthcare, et cetera. So the research teams at Google, but also elsewhere in academia, publish papers, a lot of papers, um, to demonstrate the advances in their findings. And in the recent years, what we've seen is that the number of papers posted on archive, which is a very popular repository for, for research, in general, in machine learning in particular, has greatly increased. In fact, it has surpassed the 
Moore's Law. So you have now over 90 new machine learning papers every day on archive. This says something about how popular the field has become, but this interest, um, I believe, also means that the results of the research is being used in many meaningful ways in different fields. So what has happened and what, what did lead us to, to this state? So um, <clears throat> the main driving force or the main um, area now, the most popular one in machine learning is called deep learning, which is basically a rebranding of artificial neural networks. So what neural networks do is um, given an input, they learn different layers of a hierarchy of representations. And these representations are increasingly discriminative and they end up with a final layer that performs the job that we actually are interested in, be it classification or segmentation or detection or something else. So what is new here is that in the recent years, people have developed new methods to train very deep neural networks. And this also, these new algorithms <coughs> that have been introduced with regularization and all those things that you certainly know about, uh, they came at a moment where we have much more data than we used to have and much more computational power. So all this resulted in a very rapid progress in this field and what we've seen is that um, sorry. Oops. Um, these, these, these models can now be used for various tasks even beyond classification. So now you can have in every cell phone you have applications that allow you to to predict what is in an image given, um, what is in a given image that you may take from your, uh, your cell phone, or just to transcribe what you say um, in, let's say, Google Voice or, or Siri if you have an iPhone, or to, to translate between different languages, right? So if you end up in a country where you don't speak the language, if it is one of those countries that speak um, the languages for which machine translation is working very well. I will come back to this later. Um, you can just use any off the shelf, um, any popular translation system and, and it, it does the job most of the time. And these systems actually they can go beyond just merely saying that X object is present in an image. They can give pretty accurate description of what is going on in an image. And this area is known as image captioning. So all these progress are really recent because in 2011, the best systems, the best image classification systems were making a mistake on the, on the main benchmarks every four images, right? They, they make a mistake on classifying the image to the right category, while the human uh, performance is <coughs> is about five percent, but in a matter of five years, we've gone to twenty six percent to three percent error. Right? Some people say that we have gone from machines not being able to see to machines being able to see. I think it's a nice analogy because um, the moment where humans as well started to see and and understand better the environment was significant in terms of intelligence. So these techniques that led to this, um, this development are used now to tackle some of the most important challenges. So in 2008, the US National Academy of, um, of Engineering published the Grand Engineering Challenges for the 21st Century. And all these areas you see here in red are areas where machine learning is used today to ac either accelerate the, the, the discoveries or to s actually solve the problems um, or just to rediscover or understand better 
uh, some of the existing techniques. And I'm going to just talk about few areas or few um, research results that I'm very excited about uh, and I, that I believe are very important for humanity and for this region uh, in Africa in particular. So one of this is how do we use machine learning to advance health informatics. So I apologize in advance for those who were here um, yesterday because I'm sure you have had a much more comprehensive talk uh, from Daniel Belgrave. But I'm just going to um, give you an overview of what people do today with deep learning, um, especially at Google in this area. So, <coughs> so diabetic retinopathy is one of the fastest growing cause of blindness in the world. So if you're in Africa, you can see that 14.2 million cases we do we have every year. So this is very important in a place where the population is very young and and rapidly growing. And most of the time this can be cured if it is diagnosed early. The problem is that in most places in the world the number of qualified or specialist ophthalmologists is very low um, compared to the population, the size of the population. And this is especially true here in Africa, but in other areas as well, like India or China or anywhere in the develop, developing world. So the, reg the way people usually diagnose um, this condition is by doing this regular screening where they, they look at these images and uh, to detect certain anomalies and certain problems. But this is very difficult for a non-skilled ophthalmologist, which, as I mentioned earlier, is very rare. So the shortage is really important in certain areas. So in the whole India, there is um, a shortage of 127,000 eye doctors. So nearly half of the patients, they suffer from uh, uh, vision loss before being diagnosed, before actually seeing a doctor. So if we can come up with techniques that at least partially automate or augment the ophthalmologist so that we can diagnose these diseases earlier, it, would, it could have a dramatic, um, um, a tremendous impact on the health system. So diabetic retinopathy is um, is diagnosed by looking at retinal fitness images and the ophthalmologists they grade the images in one of these five categories it goes from healthy to disease and that's exactly what researchers did um, some researchers at Google so they, they took a bunch of these images and showed it to to ophthalmologists to to crowdsource basically uh, to label the images not to crowdsource it and then use those images to train deep neural networks. And when, after training these deep neural networks on many, many, many images, they tested how powerful these models are, how accurate they can diagnose the condition based on images, and how this compares with the diagnosis provided by ophthalmologists. And what they found out is that they can, they can have diagnoses that are pretty much on par with um, with ophthalmologists, the specialist ophthalmologists, but that's two or three years ago. And a year later, they started achieving a, an accuracy in the diagnosis that is on par with the specialists. Right. So this, when we look at the um, the um, the shortage we know exists in terms of number of specialist ophthalmologists in certain areas. It can have a massive impact if it were deployed in, um, in the healthcare system. But what's more exciting about this research is that it has led to completely new discoveries. So the researchers who worked on this project, they found out that 
many markers can actually be predicted just from these images and by, by these deep neural networks. So for example, by looking at these images, you can predict the age of a person, the gender, you can predict um, whether or not the person has certain heart disease condition or uh, whether they smoke or not on all these things. And, uh, and in terms of application and in terms of diagnosing other conditions, this can also be very, very important. So healthcare is, um, is an important area with a lot of potential for all the techniques that have been developed recently for machine learning in general. And some of them, which are techniques called sequence-to-sequence -sequence models that are used for neural machine translation, for example, can be used to do various things in, um, in healthcare. So this seminal paper that appeared at NeurIPS a few years ago has been used to do many different things, from smart replies, um, which you've certainly used at Google, or machine translation, or many other things. So what researchers are doing now is to use exactly the same techniques with medical records to predict if the patient, for example, will be readmitted to the hospital after X days or if the, um, the likely length of hospital stay for a patient, et cetera, et cetera. And this research is done with, uh, in collaboration with universities. And it has already read, led to some, uh, some important results. So for example, they can now predict 24 hours in advance, right, 24 hours earlier, the mortality risk in terms of prediction accuracy. So imagine you can predict more accurately than some doctors uh, 24 hours in advance the mortality risk. This gives you a lot of time um, for certain conditions. It's just game changing. It gives you more time to take action. Um, and it could help save many lives. So, but health doesn't just mean for humans, right? So all these techniques have, are developed and most of the time open source. They have also been used by other researchers and sometimes even not non-researchers, just people working in other areas um, to diagnose or to monitor the health of, let's say, cows here. Uh, which is what some um, some farmers in Netherlands did. So they built sensors and, and, and built models in TensorFlow to monitor the health of the cows and apparently healthier cows and happier cows produce better milk. So um, this is also an important application. But it also means beyond humans and animals, how can we use the same tools to make sure our crops are healthier and, and this means applying the technique to agriculture. When we know that in certain, certain regions, um, certain crop diseases are, um, are very prevalent and it, it becomes a matter of food security, being able to use these techniques to diagnose early on certain crop diseases can be uh, game changing. And that's exactly what the uh, International Institute of Tropical Agriculture did in collaboration with uh, certain researchers from University of Pennsylvania, uh, researchers as well from Univer Makerere University in Uganda used the same techniques to um, and, and applied it to uh, diagnose uh, cassava diseases. Right. So I wanted to show you this um, this video, which in which they explain what they what they did. Cassava is a really important crop. It provides for over 500 million Africans every day. When all other crops fail, farmers know that they can rely on their cassava plants to provide them food. There are several diseases that affect cassava, and these diseases make the roots unedible. It is very crucial to actually control and manage these diseases. So we're trying to use machine learning to respond to those diseases. And TensorFlow is the best foundation for our solutions. The app that we've designed can diagnose multiple diseases. It's called Nuru, Swahili for light. The light that farmers can use to see their problems and find solutions. 
you wave your phone over a specific leaf, look at it, and if it has a symptom, a box will pop up saying you have this problem. When you get a diagnosis, we have an option for you to get advice and learn about the best management practices. The object detection that we use through TensorFlow relies upon our team annotating images. We've collected over 5,000 high quality images of different cassava diseases for this project. We use a single shot detector model on a mobile net architecture. It's able to make predictions in less than one second. Instead of having to implement thousands of lines of code, TensorFlow provides a library of functions that allow us to build architectures in much less time. We need something that can be deployed on a phone without any connection. TensorFlow is able to shrink these neural networks to be able to fit on your mobile device. The human input is absolutely critical. We're really building something that augments your experience and makes you better at your job. So with AI tools and machine learning, you can improve the yields, you can protect your crops, and you can have a much more reliable source of food. AI offers the prospect to fundamentally transform the life of hundreds of millions of farms around the world. So, um... As you, as you saw, it can be complex techniques that are made available, can be reused by people who are not really expert to do meaningful things. And in certain cases, it can, have, it can be really impactful. And similar techniques actually can be used in other fields. Um, so for example, to engineer better medicines, or maybe to uh, make solar energy more efficient, or to, to manage nitrogen cycles which I, if, if, you've, um, if you're interested in, um, in combustion and energy efficiency, can be extremely important in terms of, um, for cars, for, for many different things. So I wanna just, just say a few words about, about the first applications as well. So this is um, how people based on on molecules, how people use uh, various techniques to predict the properties of certain molecules. Right? So this is how they end up building certain drugs that you buy at the pharmacy. They need just to know uh, the properties of molecules, to know how they react, etc. So, so far, the most prevalent technique is to, um, to design models that these properties based on density, functional, um, transform density functional theory and uh, this is a very costly approach right? it takes a lot of time to do this and the, um, the time you take to do it actually dictates how fast you can discover new molecules how far how fast you can you can understand better the molecules that you, you know that people are synthesizing and all that so recently, researchers started using some, um, some deep learning based methods called um, message passing neural networks that literally took the, the turnover from 10 to the power of 3 seconds to uh, 10 to the power of minus 2 seconds. And what this means is that it makes discovery 300 thousand times faster. So this allows to do much, much more experiments and, and allows to, to accelerate other sciences in this case. So this, these type of applications are also very important and thanks to the new recent advances in machine learning, they are possible. So all these things are possible because we have tools that allow us not to reinvent the wheel, right? We have frameworks in machine learning today that allow a non-expert to take just a few lines of code to train a model. And, and this, these frameworks like TensorFlow are extremely popular. So they, they have um, a very large ecosystem of developers, researchers, uh, working on building, adding new functionalities, um, and, and using it in various ways. So it's mainly developed at Google, but um, it's, it's very widely used. So what is TensorFlow? It's just a, um, a framework that allows you to define your neural network as a computational graph, and it 
incorporates automatic differentiation, which means that um, you don't have to write down the gradients anymore. So if you're not a um, machine learning pra practitioner or if this is not your job, that's absolutely great. But if you're a student, you should just learn to write down the gradients and not use this in the first place. Maybe use it later after you <laughs> after you you are trained to to write down the gradients. But but overall, it's it's very popular and it's extremely useful. So it it there are many other great um, environments and um, and frameworks. But it appears that this one is very popular and um, I would advise to try it. So so in order to take the best out of this this technology, it's important that to make it available to the as many people as possible. So as I said before, most of the research we do today is performed in in the Western world, I would say. And the needs in those places may be sometimes different from from what we would need here. And and I just give you an example. If you if you train a neural network and you're sitting somewhere in France or in or in North America and you want to deploy the model, the neural network you train on a phone, chances are high that you may have um, the last iPhone or Android phone which is as powerful as certain computers. So you don't have um, very resource constrained environment to deploy your model on. But if you are here, it's very likely in many cases that your, your smartphone is not as powerful as, the, as those ones which are very expensive. So how do we today in a mobile first environment, and in fact this place is mobile only because most people don't even own computers, they only have uh, smartphones, right? Because the smartphones do the job. They, they use it for for everything you need, for emails, for um, banking, mobile money, and all those things. So how do we design and build an AI for places where you have devices that are uh, with very strong computation and memory constraint? So one way of doing this is to look for an alternative for the current recipe for success machine learning, right? So currently what makes a machine learning project successful is you have a lot of expertise, right? When you have people who can build and train these models and a lot of data and a lot of computation. But if you have less machine learning expertise and I hope this will no longer be, very soon, it will no longer be a problem in this region thanks to um, events like this one. Um, so, um, but if you also have a shortage of computation, right, what you can do is to find ways to remove or reduce the, the impact of these two factors in the way new machine learning models are designed. And there, researchers working in this area which is very exciting called AutoML and uh, basically it consists in removing humans in the, from the loop and designing learning machines that automate the learning process, right? So they basically consist in taking candidate models, training them and uh, measuring the performance and changing the building blocks so that the next models you find are better and doing that iteratively many, many times lead to better models. Um, so it has been used to, to to discover new architectures, especially in computer vision. So if you own an Android phone today um, or you may have heard of something called mobile net, uh, which is a very tiny neural network that was um, built this way, actually, and, and which, which performs really well. So if you look at the evolution of performance of deep learning models for, let's say here, image classification, it took a lot of human expertise 
uh, to reach this performance, right? So very skilled researchers, very experienced, decide over months of, after months of research that you should add this small connection or you should make this small modification to make the model work better. So the, it, the, the time it takes to iterate is much, much longer. And, um, and eventually it led to what we know today, but by using these new techniques, it is possible to design better neural networks that are much more, um, that are s sometimes as accurate as existing models, but that also can be designed with uh, constraints, computational constraints in mind, so that for a given budget in terms of memory and compute, uh, we can have the best models possible. So these models have been tested and in this, um, this benchmark which compares models in terms of efficiency, uh, some of the best models uh, here called uh, AmoebaNet and, um, and another ResNet were actually designed using, um, using these um, AutoML algorithms. So when these, oops, when these um, these techniques are mature and can be deployed on phones, and when they are when they are available to many people, we will be able to do to tackle challenges that so far we thought were impossible. And and here's one of the challenges I'm very excited about. Uh, this is something we're actively working on uh, in the lab here is uh, machine translation. So if you live in Europe, there are about 300 languages. If you're in Africa, there are more than 2,000 languages, and this is a very conservative estimation. Um, it's linguistically by far the most diverse place in the world, and the very concept of a language actually is different when you go from here to Europe, because um, if you are in certain regions in, in Ghana, for example, people will speak a mix of two languages, right? Um, if you are in, the, the separation is not as clear as it is in other places. And the way we design these learning machines today does not take that into account. It's whether you speak language X or language Y, right? It's not, it's, um, it's much, it leverages much less this information about how uh, the diversity and how mixed these languages are and how rich it is to exploit this information potentially. So <clears throat> this is something we're very exciting, excited about and we're actively working on. So another research area um, in the same vein, which is uh, very relevant to this context and people are working on this in the lab here in Accra as well, is uh, um, how to, to use modern techniques of computer vision similar to the ones that I, I, I show were used to, to diagnose diabetic retinopathy. How do we use these techniques to analyze satellite imagery in order to better understand the population and extract socioeconomic factors that can inform better policy decisions? So one application, one potential application is to do census. So one person, one researcher in the team here, John Quinn, is working on using these techniques to support uh, statistics agencies in Africa, in here in um, uh, Uganda and, and in other places uh, to improve the census and improve the estimates of the population. Because today we know or we have all heard that we are seven billion people in the world, but nobody really asks where the number comes from, right? So, in fact, it's just an aggregate of the estimates, um, estimated population of different countries. But if you go in a country like Sudan, for example, the last time they did a census is 40 years ago, right? So, so in many countries, the people really don't know how many people live there. They just make these estimates. And it'd be good to have accurate models um, that can um, support better um, and bridge this, this knowledge gap. So um, while building all these models and, and all these techniques, I'm sorry, uh, some people just woke up. 
um, it's important to to keep in mind a, a thoughtful use of AI in society right, from the moment we build it. And I'm very happy uh, Google abides um, by what we call the AI principles, which is a set of rules that says what we will do and what we will not do with with AI. And um, it's it's important that society in general, which means machine learning practitioners, but but beyond, uh, have an opinion about this and um, and engage a dialogue and discussions in in these areas. So so there is a lot of uh, work beyond this principle going on inside Google um, in in AI and fairness, and uh, this is an area I'm very excited about. But many people across the company also work in, the, in these areas. Right. So one last thing I want to speak about, which is something I'm 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 extremely passionate about, is how to uh, how to improve AI education here and and what this event thanks for inviting me is one instance of important forums to discuss these questions because the technology we want to build or the technology we will need across Africa will only be relevant to us if we build it ourselves right because in general, people may not have the right solutions, may not have the technical tools, but they certainly know their problems better. So when we work on putting the knowledge and the tools, the technical tools in the hands of people who actually have the challenges, usually they come up with much, much better solutions. And we have seen this happen in the past uh, here with mobile money and many other things. So. This happens with initiatives like the deep learning in Dalba. It happens, uh, its progress in this area also happens with new programs in different institutions, but also um, industry supports, like Google and other companies also support the development of AI education in Africa by providing grants, uh, faculty grants to professors in various institutions, uh, PhD grants, but also by supporting certain programs. So um, I'm also a faculty at the African Institute of Mathematical Science where we launched last year the, the Masters of Machine Intelligence, which is a, um, a flagship program in this field in, in Africa, and um, where most of the courses are taught by some leading scientists in the field who generously donate the time to come and, and teach the courses. And um, I actually want to show you a small clip of the students about talking about their experience and what they want to achieve with this program. My name is Sara Ibrahim. I am from Egypt. I have a master's degree in computer science. And I have also another bachelor degree in Arabic studies. My name is El Tayyib Ahmed. Uh, I'm from Sudan. I did my undergraduate at University of Khartoum. I did it in electrical and electronic engineering. I specialized in software. Uh, in my final year of my undergrad, I did a project on creating smarter traffic lights, and that was my introduction to the field of machine intelligence. So I used uh, different kinds of machine intelligence in that project. My name is Nyawe Jonas. I'm Cameroonian. I'm a computer engineer, graduated in 2016 from Polytechnique Yaoundé. Je m'appelle Abemini Gifon Marianne. Je suis Camerounaise, je viens de Yaoundé, où j'ai eu un master en physique à l'Université de Yaoundé 1. Et par la suite, je suis allée à Limbe, à Ims Cameroun, où j'ai eu un master en sciences mathématiques. My name is Abigail Anka and I'm a Ghanaian. I have a bachelor's degree in statistics and mathematics. Je suis Awa Samake. Je viens du Mali, plus précisément de Ségou. J'ai deux masters. Le premier, je l'ai fait en Algérie à l'Université des sciences et de la technologie Wari Boumediene. Et le second, je l'ai obtenu cette année, je l'ai fait à l'Université Pierre et Marie Curie. 
when I finished my master, I took lots of uh, online courses, uh, but this was, wasn't enough. So I applied for this program uh, because it was focused and it has very, uh, very diverse uh, fields like natural language processing, computer vision, and this will help me to decide which topic I will uh, pursue in my PhD. I applied to this master because uh, the content given here is both very broad and very deep. Uh, machine intelligence is going to be a revolutionary field, uh, maybe as big as the industrial revolution, and this program gives you both the knowledge and the connections to start a career in this field. I applied for the African Masters of Machine Intelligence for three reasons. The first reason is that I am a computer engineer, but I have a strong interest in mathematics and its application. Then the second reason is that uh, there is a revolution going out, uh, around, around the world and about machine intelligence. So I wanted to be part of this revolution. I postulated for this master in machine intelligence because I was motivated, and for several reasons. Déjà, des experts venant de partout dans le monde pour nous enseigner, venant de Google, de Facebook et tout. C'est pas tous les jours qu'on rencontre ça. I applied for this program for two reasons. First, machine intelligence seems to me as the math of statistics. With my background of statistics and mathematics, I wanted a course where I could explore the applications of the two courses at the same time. J'ai décidé de venir ici pour approfondir mes connaissances, me perfectionner. Parce que là, on va, les cours seront donnés par des professionnels, des experts du, du domaine. Et là, ça, je ne pourrais qu'en accueillir plus pour pouvoir réaliser mes rêves. My main objective in this program is that I want to learn the foundations of machine learning. Uh, so I hope to gain two things mainly from this program. Uh, I hope to gain the necessary knowledge to start a career in machine learning and also the connections. Mon souhait serait de faire un PhD. I plan to use this knowledge to interpret machine learning algorithms to be able to uh, use them in the informatics field because uh, we want a reliable diagnosis, diagnosing system. So this is my plan for uh, the PhD. My career objective is to be an applied mathematician in research and academia where my abilities will contribute to pos positive social change. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'm very excited that we are we'll be extending the program to to Ghana next year. So starting uh, actually this year in in September, we'll be running the program both in um, in Rwanda, in Kigali, and here in uh, in Accra, in in Ghana. So uh, this is um, um, this type of programs is getting more pro more popular in many universities, and many universities are putting in place. Um, graduate degrees in, in machine learning and it's it's very very important so um, just to to sum up I think um, the field has progressed extremely rapidly in the past 10 years and we are already seeing the impact machine learning and AI is having on society it's literally transforming every industry. And the economists actually call it today a general purpose technology to emphasize the fact that it has become an accelerator. But I believe the biggest impact of AI is yet to happen. And my opinion is what we will do with AI here in Africa will be the most important will lead to the most important discoveries in terms of impact, but also in, in terms of impact in societies, because we will soon have the largest population um, on this planet, but also just in terms of pure scientific discoveries. So this all makes me very excited to be working in the field here in Africa and to, to uh, share uh, discussions with um, people in these forums like like this. So thanks again for um, for inviting me um, to speak here, and uh, I will be very happy to take some questions if we have time.